Welcome to another episode of the CPG Guys podcast. Our co-hosts, Sri Rajagopalan and Peter V.S. Bond, explore how brands and retailers engage with consumers online, in-store, and everywhere in between. And now, here are Sri and Peter. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this special Thanksgiving Week 2020 episode of the CPG Guys podcast. I'm your co-host, Sri Rajagopalan, an e-commerce evangelist who has had the fortune of starting up and scaling digital retail at Johnson & Johnson, Revlon, and Frito-Lay, amongst other brands. And when I'm not doing this podcast with my co-host, Peter Bond, I've also helped launch ZenQL, a 100% natural supplements brand to help aid your sleep, energy, better movement, stress, and anxiety relief, and male wellness. Do check it out at www.zenQL.com or simply search ZenQL, that's Z-E-N-F-U-E-L on Amazon. Zenfuel, where your happiness is our ambition. And this is a special episode. We are the special guests, and I am joined as always by my co host, the man, the legend of data, drumroll, insights, loyalty, and voice of the consumer. He's VP at Retail Strategy at Power Reviews. And by last measurement, he's only 1.74 degrees of separation from everybody in the CPD industry. They love him. They know of him. He knows them all. Welcome, Mr. Peter Vias Bond. Shri, thank you. As always, such a pleasure. You are the green beans to my cream of mushroom soup. You're the cornbread in my stuffing, the bourbon glaze on my baked ham. We go together, and Thanksgiving, we're here. We're ready to celebrate. Let's have a great episode, shall we, old friend? Indeed, and uh, what a pleasure this has been doing uh, doing this with you in 2020. You know, we started this again in April. This was supposed to be fun, a conversation, and here we are, 50 episodes in. How Who would have thunk, right? I mean, seriously, this was just something to keep us occupied. And I think we're both, we're amazed, but we're not amazed. We chose a topic that we thought there was a niche that no one was addressing, and we jumped into it. And it seems to resonate with so many people. We've got a, a LinkedIn page with thousands of followers. We're getting hundreds and hundreds of downloads every week. Uh, we've built a huge community. We created a LinkedIn group called CPG e-commerce. Uh, this is really resonating. People seem to take to it. I think we've we found something, and I think it's probably because we just love doing it. It's our Talk passion. That, Peter, when you talk about a topic that matters, yeah, people actually engage in conversation. Hmm. So let what me remind our audience. Let me remind the audience. You can find all of our content, our audio what? podcasts on fifteen plus platforms, a YouTube channel that includes playlists from a profit series, our retail series, and our women's leadership series that we conducted in October, and so much more. All you got to do is open up your browser and type cpgguys.com. The Ask You Responded part two is actually here, Peter. Yep. A couple of weeks ago, we took a vote on what's the next area y'all want us to focus on. Y'all is my Texas twang, by the way. And this is what I'm, you, you know, I'm Southern too. I, I grew up in Southern Canada. So that's absolutely, so I, got, I can twang too. I got to hear your y'alls. I got to go all y'alls. Y'all. Peter, there we go. He's, he's, he's practicing. He'll get there. He'll join me soon. We asked, you responded, and what you've asked us for is to do a deeper dig into e-commerce insights and analytics. So thank you for all the votes. It was quick. Within the first couple of days, we had our answer. It was pretty clear. That's where we need to go. Our cpgguys.com series, the focus in January 2021 is going to be insights and analytics in the e-commerce era. And we're gonna do this with a special guest that we will name very shortly. So look out for that. Uh, we are actually getting ranked 23 from the industry. How about that, Peter? Any thoughts to add on that one? My two favorite words, rank punditry, you know that. Rank punditry, rank punditry is to me as retail media is to you, Shri. Absolutely, Peter. So without further ado, we are going to get into our special episode, which covers the CPG retail industry and the remarkable and rapid transformation to omni-channel in 2020. But I want to discuss the word e-commerce. You know, I, like you, Peter, both of us have grown up in a world of the 
business model where practically every brand's PNL, supply chain operations, efficiency, everything was built around delivering bulk product into the warehouse of a redistributor, aka a retailer. And the word e-commerce was always deemed as something not really here for today, 10 years out, and something that was more a fascination and let's check the box versus let's get it done, let's move 800 miles an hour. Some moved 800 miles an hour in the era from about 2015 to now. And when the pandemic hit March of 2015, uh, 2020, uh, not 2015, I stand corrected. Um, what happened is those that were already leading in digital and e-commerce have significantly benefited from having great e-commerce operations this year. To me, we need to stop saying this is about just omni-channel transformation. This is about a retail apocalypse or a store apocalypse. We need to stop saying the store traffic will come back to the epic proportions in January, 2020. Folks, end the debate. E-commerce is here. The consumer shop on e-commerce, it's a word. It's the future of the industry. Digital browsing is how it's happening today. I'm going to stop even saying future of the industry. Get going, folks. Get on your e-commerce stream. Choo -choo. What do you think, Peter? What's going on in the industry? Sri, but before I start jumping in and talking about some specific retailers, let me just echo what you said. If you're not in the game, you're going to lose the game. And we have to start recognizing that e-commerce is more than just a completely separate method of shopping a retailer. It's all about digital influence. We've talked about the convergence of, that's really what Omnichannel is about. If you're walking through a store and you need to learn about products, you want to be able to open up that retailer's mobile app and get all the content you need to make the decision. Bingo. If a retailer doesn't understand it, there's a retailer out in Seattle we know very well, it's more than happy to give content to your consumers, even, even if they're walking your store, and take them out of the purchase cycle. So yeah, this is a big thing. So let's get into the, some of the retailers. I'm going to start, let's start at the alphabet right at the top, Albertsons. Great one, Albertsons Safeway. Uh, recently released their quarterly numbers. Wow. ID store sales up 13% driven a lot by digital sales, which were up almost 250%. In fact, they have 90, 950 stores now. With Bopus, 200 of them accept Snap as a payment mechanism. Talk about serving a community increasingly, right? We've talked about this. We'll get to it in a little bit around Instacart with what they're doing with Aldi, but making sure that the unbanked community has a mechanism to involve themselves with safer forms of commerce is important. It's also a growth opportunity. Let's not forget that. It's important from the standpoint of we need to be servicing so many consumers and it will drive growth in the enterprise. So good on them. They plan to have almost all 950 of those by the middle of next year. And meanwhile, while they're doing that, they're going to grow their footprint from 950 to almost 1,600 stores with buy online, pick up in store, Bopus, buy online, pick up at curb, call it what you will. There are a lot of different terms. What it really means is you buy it online, you drive to the store, they put it in your car, and off you go. But Albertsons really knocking it out of the park. They, they, are, they are hitting home runs out in Boise and Pleasanton right now. So Albertsons, let it be recognized as the first one on this special Thanksgiving week 2020 episodes that the CPG guys, Peter and I are putting out where we're calling them out for the amazing digital transformation they have undertaken in the past few years and have done a service to the in 2020 of having, like you said, Bopis in every store that they actually yeah. Yeah, Shri. And, and as we've talked about Albertsons, one of the other ones I briefly mentioned with Instacart, What's going on with them? Let's jump right into Instacart, right? I remember talking to Neelam from Instacart way, way back in 2011, 2012, when they were just about getting warmed up and started. A lot of rhetoric, you know, five years building up after that, six, seven years after that. It's a concierge shopping mechanism. Brands are not going to adapt it. It's extra expensive. You know, Instacart actually did an amazing thing 
for the brand community, which is they built in the premium of servicing, aka the cost of shipping, fulfillment, pick packing, et cetera, into the price of the product. And also was done very intelligently as well as very sophisticated. The consumer knew they were paying more, they were getting trained, while at the same time, it was invisible to brands and, and the system was perfectly done. To me, if I could roll back, I would tell everybody back in 2012, 13, jump on Instacart. But what's going on in 2020? Instacart has moved from a nice to have kind of concierge service for those who are willing to pay more to it's now an institutionalized word in the CPG retail industry. I want to just call out some examples of who you can shop at with Instacart and where I live in New York City. And while New York City is not representative of the whole country, I'm just going to call out some retailers. Best Buy. Best Buy has epic click and collect. The Disney store. What does it have to do with grocery? Wegmans. I know that's your favorite, Peter, because whenever Peter drives to New Jersey, he cannot wait to go into the Wegmans store. Tree. I drove Saturday morning. I got up at 5 a.m. and I drove an hour to Harrison, New York, so I could do my Thanksgiving shopping. Wegmans. At Wegmans. That's how loyal I am. And I know I'm not alone. They have a phenomenal store. I join you in that journey. I want to come back to Aldi because you mentioned about the special relationship with Aldi. To me, that relationship with Aldi is an enabler for the middle and lower income families to be able to- Unbanked, unbanked particularly. Unbanked is the right word here. And thank you Instacart and Aldi for enabling that. We want to call it out. Key food in New York. How about Costco? Costco stores have been incredibly busy with traffic in the last few weeks and months of the pandemic. And then there's CVS, there's Petco, there's West Side Market, there's Italy. Are you familiar with Italy? I, I remember a guy who used to be an owner of Italy. We don't mention him anymore. And the world famous, New York famous Western Beef. And of, as of late, Lynn Chocolates and the epic beauty and skincare retailer, Sephora. Let's not so, forget, let's not forget their West Coast test with Walmart. Absolutely. I, I seven. Hold on, I got to hold up an extra foot here because I only have 10 fingers. 7-Eleven, wow, what a big one. And, and, the, and the list I gave is a microcosm of the partnerships Instacart has. Scratching to, the surface. To me, if you're a retailer, do you need to create a home delivery service from scratch on a wafer tin PL? This is a partnership made in heaven. And I want to remind our listeners that this partnership was covered in episode 26 of the uh, season one, 2020 by you and me, Peter, where we had Josh Ryder, the head of yep. brand partnerships at Instacart. So brands, if you want to learn more, rewind back, just go to the Apple CPG podcast, listen in to episode 26, and you can learn a whole bunch more. While I discuss Instacart, Epic, here for a lifetime, Peter, let me flip it over and tell us a little bit about What's going on north of the border? Because there is an epic e-commerce transformation taking place that often here in the U.S. we haven't noticed. Well, you may not have noticed, Shri, but I have. But then again, I'm a Canadian and all my family lives north of the border. Let's talk about Loblaw. They have very enviable market share, north of 34%. So one in every three grocery dollars spent in Canada goes through Loblaw. Their quarter was off the charts. They had ID same source sales of 6.9% growth and e-commerce sales of 175% growth. They've got a really interesting model. So their grocery business pretty much operates through Instacart. Again, another partnership that is working very well. Their pharmacy division, their drug division, Shoppers Drug Mart actually does direct to consumer mostly for beauty and, and personal care. I know that because Power Reviews is a ratings and reviews partner for Shoppers Drug Mart, but they're getting, it, they're getting it all right. They are leading the industry there. They figured out how to do it. They have a great partnership with Instacart and good on them. They, they have 
weathered this particular pandemic extremely well, and I only expect their market share to improve over time. Good on Loblaw. They know what they're doing. Speaking of north of the border, the one thing I failed to mention when I discussed Instacart was they're also now in Canada, Peter. And so if, if you're in Canada and you're listening into our episode, look out for Instacart. They're here. They're going to scale epically in Canada. You know, Shri, this discussion would not be complete if we just didn't address the elite retailer in the room. In Your the, favorite discussion I, topic. Tell me about what's going on down in Bentonville at this little place called Walmart. My favorite retailer that I believe is built for tough times, easy times, fun times, harsh times, and why I call them the most elite retailer on planet Earth with a store footprint that crosses 4,500 stores and is within fi a five mile radius of what I publicly is often shared as a rhetoric as every household in America. This episode will be remiss if we didn't recognize the rapid omni-channel transformation of Walmart. Today I found out Janie Whiteside took over as cust uh, chief customer officer for Walmart is the day I knew this journey was well on its underway. Well on its, and, and you know, we were supposed to have a top to top with Walmart in January uh, that ended up getting postponed unfortunately, but the message was clear back in January. This is pre-pandemic Peter. Omnichannel is the future for this retailer. So things that I observed in 2020 that I think are differentiators, the um, fusion of all the multiple apps Walmart had from a consumer perspective for shopping into one app where you can do grocery as well as durables, as well as general merchandise. The epic arrival of the Walmart media group. That seed was planted well last year. And a reminder to our listeners, we actually spoke to Two people from Walmart, specifically on the Walmart media group side and the partnerships you can execute with them with Matthew Smith, who is a leader for the Walmart media group in uh, both the pharma as well as the beauty and skincare side. That was episode 43, Peter. And um, not only is Walmart, Walmart media group arrived, but the enabling brand partnerships for click and collect in every store with a 4,500 plus store footprint. And in 2020, one of the most, and Peter knows I love using the word 2020. One of the most important observations that I want to put out is Walmart has embraced Black Friday going online for far more than simply following the shopper. Sanitation, yep. responsibility, not having epic queues standing outside for hours within an era of social responsibility. I want to say salute. Fuck. Yeah, they, they, they're not opening their stores on Thanksgiving. Thank goodness that they well done, Walmart. that trend. Salute from the CPG guys. And then a couple more Walmart stats I want to throw at you, Shri. Um, not only we, did we talk about Walmart, but remember, we also had Stephen Carroll on from the Sam's Club division. Yes. The latest numbers, they saw their online sales for Sam's Club grow 41% in the quarter versus year ago. And Stephen told us in his episode about the incredible capability of Scan and Go. Now, I tried Scan and Go yesterday for my first time in a Walmart store, and it worked like a dream. I just walked up, scanned the QR code at the register, contactless payment. I walked out of the store, no muss, no fuss. Wow. Between that and Walmart Plus and so many more things that they've got going for them, Sky's the limit for Walmart. Stephen Carroll, you are always welcome on the show anytime you want to come back. And thank you for educating us on the Sam's Club journey. I personally did not know the journey of Sam's Club's omni-channel transformation until Stephen got to us. So that's episode 44 for our listeners. Shame on us, Shri, that Shame we didn't me. understand it. We're so grateful that he helped bring that knowledge to us. Episode 44, week of November 16. Just a reminder, I want to just point out one last thing, the numbers. 79% growth in Q3 in Ecom, 97% growth in Q2. And I want to call out my friend from who's helping the internal journey of transformation, connecting merchandisers with the Walmart Media Group. We had her on from Walmart right down there in Bentonville, Whitney Cooper in episode 40, if you want to take a deeper dive. But Peter, that's Walmart. There's another general merchandiser in town. 
that's way up in the north and actually is close to your home country. What's going on there? Well, you know, we kind of consider Minnesota to be part of Canada, particularly when it comes to hockey. But let's put that aside. Target stores. Wow, another great quarter for them. Their Omni sales were up almost 21%, driven by digital at plus 155%. Their average transaction versus year ago, up 15.5%. Wow, is that tremendous. Their curbside business is up 500%. Their shipped home delivery business, 280% growth. Target's killing it. These numbers, you know, they may not have the scale the that Walmart has, but they are destroying the numbers. I mean, these numbers are astronomical, Peter. What's the mojo behind such incredible numbers and digital transformation? Is it leadership? Is it every store? Is it click and collect? Is it the website? The one number I didn't talk about is the size of their loyalty program. We've got 80 million households now by all accounts. That's, a, that's huge. Up. They are they are killing it. People love to shop at Target. It has its own little click, its own little genre. The stores are great. Why would you? Of course, they're doing well. They figured it out. Here's what's great about the, the curbside solution. When they launched it, it was only for shelf stable. They've now enabled their stores with refrigerated and frozen units. So you can actually do curbside for perishables. That is game changing. They're, they understand the success that Walmart see. They know they have to be in that game and they are, they are rolling it out and deploying it as quickly as possible. And now for my fellow New Yorkers, we also have a tar Target, Target store in Hell's Kitchen on 43rd and Amsterdam. How good is that, Shri? You wanna guess who's gonna be there on Black Friday? uh not me tough i'm one. thinking maybe you tough one. maybe you tough one, tough one. so shri let's go from minnesota down to georgia 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 what's going on down at home depot shri anything big going on with them besides my favorite flavor of peaches yeah georgia ain't nothing better than georgia peaches there's a whole lot going on in georgia right now isn't there shri we're going to leave politics aside, but there's all sorts of stuff going on there. Oh, boy. It's also home of the Atlanta Braves, for the record, as well as Michael Wick's team, who Shri might know a little bit about, having got Just a little in the attack. And it's the home of none other than Home Depot, mm -hmm. which I want to call out in particular as a learning lesson for CPG and CPG retailers. And that is... When I was shopping for home uh, construction projects in a work I do down in Texas when I lived there in 2011, I was shopping click and collect on Home Depot. And, and I could literally create an order of 30, 40 things on a home makeover, redo, a kitchen, a bathroom, all the way from faucets to flooring to tiling, color palettes, the type of tiles in one transaction, Peter, in 2011. Wow. That retailer is Home Depot. And if you look at the Q3 sales e-commerce, or you just look at net revenue in general, net revenue is up 23.2% year over year in Q3. Net Shree. revenue for the retailer. Three people are sitting in their houses. They can't go anywhere. They want to do something useful. So what are they doing? They're, by, they're doing renovation yes, projects. Absolutely, Peter. And by enabling click and collect, they have helped people get over the fear that when you want to embark on a project, you got to walk the floor. Their website is built to browse, down select, ask questions, get responses, and make the whole process seamless. I want to point out that their online sales is up in Q3. 80% year over year, just like the Walmarts of the world. And Peter, the most important number I'm about to state, please pay attention, folks. 60% of those online orders are fulfilled through a store. Through a store. Yeah, they understand that that's where, why are you, how are you going to ship uh, a six foot long two by four? That's a waste of money. Everything's got to be done through the store. Here's what I love about their experience. We've talked about this in the past. 
Amazon is built for, for, for purchasing eaches. They fall down when it comes to seasonal because it's just not easy. Or basket. It's not easy to shop a seasonal need on Amazon as compared to a physical store. Home Depot has figured out how to build the ability to execute a project shopping experience fairly painlessly in a digital environment. That's why it's good doing so well. So good on Home Depot. The one thing I want to point out, Peter, just to close out Home Depot is if you look at the numbers, they have had 300 basis points of improvement on customer satisfaction. And the reason for that is everything we've just quoted. You referred to Sam's Club earlier today and our good friend, Stephen Cal, a friend of the show. What's going on on the other side of the fence with BJ's? Yeah, so BJ's, uh, for transparency purposes, we've talked about this before. BJ's is a client of Power of Views, and I work very closely with them. They're having a great time themselves. Their ID store sales are up 18.5%, and digitally enabled sales are up 200%. They do a little bit of a mixture of Instacart. They have their own click and collect. They, are, they have their own box and ship with two-day service. They're really killing it. They're big on content. They want their brands to contribute to make sure the product pages are as complete as possible with imagery, copy, ratings, and reviews. I'll tell you, their new chief digital officer, Monica Schwartz, has picked up the ball right where her, her predecessor left it. And, and the team is really driving success in a digitally, uh, a digitally engaged environment. Digitally influenced sales at BJ's are tremendous. They're, they're killing it. And I expect them to continue that through the next couple of quarters at a minimum. No kidding, Peter. Yeah, so Shri, let's talk about, they're all based in outside of Boston, right? Let's go over to the West Coast, the Northwest, the Pacific Northwest. There's this company up in Seattle. I can't remember their name, I'm pretty sure you do. They just made a big announcement that's going to rock the chain drug world. What's going on there, Shri? I better know their name because we're selling Zenfuel on that third-party marketplace. Yes. But we're, we're not going to talk about Amazon's third-party marketplace or their 1P business on CPG. We're actually going to discuss the word Amazon Pharmacy. Peter, this is a project I personally worked on in late 2018, early 2019 at a previous alma mater of mine. And it originally was floated as project 1492 within Amazon, a pretty cool word if I may say so. And uh, back then it's the acquisition of PillPack by Amazon sent shivers down the spines of the entire healthcare industry, insurer, manufacturer, pharma manufacturer, distributor, our entire lobbyists, the entire healthcare industry for the simple reason that the industry is built around, I'm, I'm not dissing it or I'm not promoting it. I'm just putting some facts out there. It's built around layers and layers of middlemen, women, call it what you may, as well as administrative services, et cetera, which make it an incredibly complex ecosystem, especially if you were, ever, if you were ever to read a um, actual insurance provider bill or a receipt that you got post any procedure or even uh, just a visit to a doctor's office, and the various lines, they're very hard to decipher. I'm not no, saying- three, There's a reason that Target sold its pharmacies to see that. It's complex as that. So it's complex and the industry was built over years and years of years. And I know healthcare is a popular rhetoric and a conversation topic in this country, no matter where you go. But the Amazon pharmacy is very unique in the sense when PillPack was acquired, the, the real fear was, What's going to happen to the industry if you're all of a sudden now able to connect the consumer with what Amazon, Jamie Dimon, and Warren Buffett did together, which was they formed an insurance provider with close to 100,000 quote-unquote possible patients, employees, call them what you may, and they became a testing ground for a significantly reduced cost insurance, which, which I think all of us in this country know. I have mentioned it's a healthcare topic. And with the announcement of Amazon Pharmacy and with the ability to also deliver the actual pharma needs to your house via home delivery and who's better at home delivery than Amazon, they are rattling the industry. At a later episode, perhaps in 2021, 
We'll get into this at a great level of detail. This one is very personal. I'm publicly declaring it's very personal to me. You all know that I went through a healthcare procedure earlier in the year, and, and I, I spent a lot of time decomposing it, so we'll get back to it. But I want to leave you guys with one thought, and that is, as I look at the drug retailers in our country, I won't name them, but you know, drug retailers have had a footfall traffic issue in 2020, needless to say, for, because of the pandemic. And, and this introduction of the Amazon pharmacy means the reason you were elite was really a pharmacy and the front of store was a small number on your uh, overall p &L. But it was a small number that bought foot traffic into the store. And if you look at the recent data, especially the October a footfall traffic report, drug chains have actually seen a downward trend with footfall traffic. And it's been up and down through the entire pandemic very early on. It was one of the only ways to go in, but now it's certainly down. If you don't get back into the world of bringing traffic back to your front of store, which is really CPG and all fast moving consumer goods at the end of the day, including paper goods, things of that nature, this is gonna be a tough battle for you. Watch out for Amazon pharmacy. I could go on about the Amazon pharmacy for hours and how this is step one in radically transforming the healthcare industry. You know, general rhetoric, maybe maybe it's not a popular opinion that I should be putting out there, but if I had said in 2001 that Amazon will rev revolutionize e-commerce and revolutionize the CPG industry as well as retail forever, it wouldn't have been a popular rhetoric either. It won't happen in a day. It took Amazon 20 years. Healthcare in our country, Amazon pharmacy will indeed transform for the better. But for the drug retailers, Pay attention, front, front of store footfall traffic is one of the various mechanisms you have to bring shoppers back into your ecosystems. And I do want to call that out, Peter. I think you're spot on, Sri. You know, that's my background as well. I'm not going to disagree with anything you're saying. There's a reason, as I mentioned, that Target decided to sell its pharmacy. It was not its core selling capability. They knew that they could put a lot of money directly to the bottom line through the sale and then focus on profitable business. I guess the question will become when the two or three major drug chains, however you want to score them, come to the conclusion that they too want to focus on their business, Amazon's going to force them to do that. Yeah, and Peter, the part that worries me a lot is I've studied this area having spent time in it, so I can go very deep in this space. What worries me is this knowledge has existed for, this seed was sold in 2014. This seed was activated with the pill pack purchase back in 2018, January or late 2017, perhaps December. And like e-commerce, the rhetoric is we'll wait and watch. It's going to go away. It's not a big deal. It's an epic earthquake for healthcare. Shri, you've seen what CVS is doing with health hubs. They're adding ophthalmology, they're adding audiology, they're adding all these other primary care types of services. Do you think they're knocking out the back wall and making room for and building whole new facilities? No, they're, they're cutting down on the floor size of CPG space. There's, there's a change going on. I know, all right. We've, I think we've, I think we've, belabored, we've belabored the pharmacy situation long enough let's 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 tune to something else Shreya. Peter I want to I want I would love for you to touch upon a fun topic and oh, yeah. you know we had the chief operating officer from Drizzly a while ago mm -hmm. and uh, we chatted with Kathy Lewenberg yep there is another e-commerce retailer well known as Bevmo and recently things have been going on what's what's been going on with them well Bevmo actually so it's a California based alcohol retailer they are brick and mortar they're part of the Drizzly network, but they just got acquired by this little Philadelphia startup called GoPuff. Now, a lot of people our age aren't familiar with GoPuff, but Gen Z and millennials, they certainly are. They I was are actually in their office in Philadelphia, March 7th of this year, trying to uh, strike a relationship for beauty and skincare with my alma mater. Yeah, I gotta tell you, they are growing like crazy. They have a very different model. Whereas Drizzly 
has a marketplace and necessarily so because of the three tier system where it's the responsibility uh, to a degree of the, the manufacturer, pardon me, the, the retailer to deliver. GoPal's a little different. They, they use dark stores or what we would call, um, uh, you know, the, a, a, a warehouse instead of fulfilling out of a store. And they're delivering convenience type products, you know, snacks, beverages, ice cream, beer, all that stuff. And they started in Philadelphia and they've gone nationwide. And now they've gone and acquired an enormous, probably the second largest non-state-owned alcohol retailer in the country behind Total Wine and More. Yes, sir. And what does that mean? Well, it means that they're about to shake things up. Why? Because I mentioned the BevMo was part of Drizzly's distribution system. How's that going to change? What's going to go on? This is an enormous piece of business. It's going to shake up 7-Eleven and 7-Now. It's going to shake up Grizzly. It'll have an impact on, on Instacart. You know what, Shree? We're very close to getting a C-level person from, from GoPuff to join us. We'll have more on that shortly. But I think getting a foundational understanding on who these guys are, what they're doing, and where they're going will be extremely interesting to our audience. So stay tuned. We got more to come. Thank you, Peter. Thank you also for um, thank you also earlier for correctly pointing out that Bevmo is a brick and mortar retailer that actually is e-commerce enabled through the Drizzly network. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I also want to call out my friend Eves Liberton here for actually taking me to GoPuff and introducing me to them back in March. So Eves, thank you. And uh, one other thing with GoPuff, you folks know at GoPuff, you're always welcome on the show. And like Peter said. We're looking forward to a senior person from uh, y'all coming over to our show and chatting with us and as well as educating brands on what the possible partnerships could be. So that's a wrap for this episode, but let's summarize it, Peter. So I think we started this episode by clearly calling out the word e-commerce. It's okay to use it. You don't have to yep. say omni-channel. You don't have to say digital visibility. You don't it's have anonymous. to- yeah, you don't have to keep saying the in-store model will bounce back. Pay attention to the word e-commerce. Staffing is up left and right. People are hiring for leadership in e-commerce roles. Our good friend, Adam Rose and Suzanne Kretal, recruiters in this space. And they've been on the show. They've been kind enough to come on the show and talk about e-commerce recruiting. And sure enough, we'll have a few more uh, talent management agents, uh, ta agents being in the entertainment world as well. I use that word. But talent management leaders come here and talk to us about that as well. Digital shopping is the way forward and stores that have a large footprint are going to be clear winners here because each one of them is a fulfillment warehouse. And one of the things we didn't do today was really get into the world of super regionals, but I want to call out several of them. I'm going to just give two or three here in the interest of time. HEB, Meyer, Wake for Nikki, the ShopRite parent company. You guys were talking to me in 2012, 2013 at NACDS. And, and via conversations on how to enable drop shipping in 2013. You guys are already born elite, folks. And there are so many others of you in super regionals who are doing this so well and have the advantage of a store footprint. And we also want to quickly recap. We Today we talked about Albertsons. We got into the world of Instacart. Then we talked about our friend up in the north, Loblaws, and one that Peter has shopped in many, many times in his life. No episode on transformation and epicness would be complete without calling out the elite retailer Walmart. Then we jumped over to another general merchandiser, Fame Target, Construction and Home Depot and why they're winning, followed by another club retailer, BJ's. We called out Sam's and our good friend, Stephen Carroll, and how the world of healthcare is about to be transformed with Amazon Pharmacy. Finally, wrapping up, uh, announcing that hopefully soon we will have someone from GoPuff come talk to us about all the wonderful things going on there and their acquisition of BevMo. And um, Peter, any summary thoughts from you? First, yeah, Shree, uh, let's talk about it's Thanksgiving. So let's talk about what we're thankful for, right? Yes, sir. I'm certainly thankful for my friendship and partnership with you. I think we've created something very exciting. I'm thankful that what we've created is resonating with our audience. I wanna thank every single one of our guests, starting with John Jessup at Reputation Studio, 
Brian Gildenberg, who really kicked off a big series. And then of, of course, the legendary Anil Agarwal from Shop Talk. And from there, it just exploded. We've had so many great guests willing to talk to us about consumer engagement, the digital world, the omni-channel, all of that. I'm just incredibly grateful that we're on this journey, that it's continuing for us, that, that this business, in spite of a horrible pandemic, we've been able to find great bright spots and innovation continues. So for all of that, we're incredibly grateful. Sri, your thoughts? And Peter, what I wanna share back with you is what a lot of our listeners don't know is we started this show in April of this year, 2020. But this show was actually the, the baking process began summer of last year. Yep. I am incredibly thankful that when I reached out to you summer of last year, you actually took a track to meet me in downtown Chicago. And um, I was at a conference and a um, business meeting and you came down, we chatted and we said, we're going to do this at some point. Here we are 50 plus episodes in with a lot more to come from the book. So thank you not only for showing up that day, but also for doing this week over week and for the epic friendship, which has standed the test of time and all the idiosyncrasies I bring to the table for you. And I want to thank all our listeners for the love you've shown us. The CPG guys here would be meaningless without your participation. Yep. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, Shri. It, I feel like I've known you 20, 30 years. Oh, wait, I have. But it, it feels like Actual. we've we've been that connected for that long. So I'm really grateful for that. And as Sheree said, we wanna thank our audience. We're incredibly grateful for this. We love your feedback. We want this podcast to be responsive to your needs. So if you wanna share your feedback, there's a very easy way to do it. We've got a new URL for you. It's called ratethispodcast.com slash CPG guys. If you go there, you can leave feedback for us on the Apple podcast. It'll take you right there. So rate this podcast.com slash CPG guys. And you can tell us what you think and where you want us to take this podcast. We're going to be back next Monday. We've got uh, an epic leader joining us. He's the North American head of digital integration with the Coca-Cola company. His name is Brian Sappington. We hope you're going to like it. We know we love talking to him. It is a great conversation about how leadership can drive growth and advancement and how you need to be a servant, truly a servant leader with great humility if you wanna get this done effectively and bring stakeholders to the table. So with that, Shri, I'll say thank you. I hope you have a great Tofurky Thanksgiving and we'll look forward to seeing you next Monday. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. I'm the only vegetarian in my house. Happy Thanksgiving, y'all. Bye-bye. <laughs>